So let us begin. It's really simple. All right. So let us begin. So the sexual reproduction in plants. We understand how sexual reproduction occurs. We understand what it is, right? This is building on what we've already, pro well, more or less gotten in CSEP biology. Really, really, it should be simple. All right. So looking at it, right? What we're generally looking at for the reproduction in plants, sexual reproduction in plants, would be referring to our angiosperms, right? We wouldn't generally be referring to our gymnosperms, right? Could anybody tell me why we're referring to angiosperms and not gymnosperms? Why are we referring to angiosperms specifically? Why? Anyone, anywhere? What are angiosperms? What are gymnosperms? And why are we looking at angiosperms in sexual reproduction and not gymnosperms? Guys? Can you guys hear me? Angiosperms are seeds in vegetables while gymnosperms are naked seeds. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh, okay. Lovely. So you can look at the seed formation. The seed formation, right? If the gymnosperms perhaps form seeds, right? But in the case of sexual reproduction, what we generally are looking at is reproductive apparatus, right? Like the flower itself, right? So what we're focusing on is in unit one biology is the flower itself, and angiosperms are flowering plants. Gymnosperms are not. Right, so stuff like that. So some examples, gymnosperms would be like ferns and conifers, as well as, well, I guess I suppose a moss could be a form of a gymnosperm, right? But what we're generally looking at is flowering plants or angiosperms, and looking at the reproductive processes within our angiosperms, right? So generally in C say well, in K, what we're focusing on is our angiosperms, all right? So the general structure, the simplistic structure of an angiosperm plant, right, the flower itself, right, the reproductive organ, right, we would have been understanding these structures since integrated science or school, right. So we would know that the flower is really made up of these fundamental criteria, right, our andresium, our genesium, right. So our andresium would would actually have our filament, right, and our anther specifically, and we know that anthers are where we have the pollen grain production, right? We tend to have um, what we call um, gametogenesis happening within the anther, right? And we're gonna look at what happens within the stonium, etc., within the anther, right? And then we're gonna have our genesium, which contains our stigma, our style, and our ovary, right? And then we're gonna have our peripheral components, right? Which we would look at, for example, the sepal, which, which actually um, protects the genesium. Right, or the ovary specifically on the genesium. We have the petals themselves that are usually used for plants or species that really um, pollinate via the attraction of different insects and different types of animals. Gen not really insects alone, but different types of animals. Right, and we have a peduncle. Right, so that peduncle basically is the thing that attaches the flower itself onto the stem. Right, so those are generally the structures that we're looking at, and the ovary. We know that inside the ovary we have what we call the ovule, right? And the ovule would be what is carrying these embryonic components, right? These different types of cells that we're gonna look at how they really move or how they really function within fertilization specifically. But the gamete, specifically the female gamete, would be in the um, ovule, right? So. Generally, we should understand the structure um, of flowers, right? So we know the male part, the andresium, has the anther and the filament, the female part, the genesium, would have the stigma style and the ovule. And then the additional, or what, we, what I call the peripheral parts, would have been the peduncle, which is here called the stalk of the flower. It connects the flower to the plant, the greater plant itself. So we're going to have the sepal itself, and we're going to have the petals, right? Everything is fine here? Yes, yeah, sir. Okay, what's not fine? Yes, 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 I said yes. Oh, you said yes. Okay, okay, lovely. All right, so everything here is fine. Okay, so the key terms that we're generally looking at, and we're going to look at more key terms as we go on, right? I thought that this is important to just get out of the way. When we talk about something being dioecious, 
right? We're talking about daikogami and protogeny and heterostyly, right? And sterility and stuff like that. What are we talking about? So I just put all the key terms here, right? This is what I did in 2021, right? So daishi. So for example, the sea grape, right? Are what we call cocoloba um, uvifera, right? Is an example of a daishious plant. So what it means is that it separates its sexes with trees, right? Producing either male or female flowers, right? So many plants that we've seen, we talk about plants being um, hermaphrodites, right? In type, in in that type of style, right? In that nature, right? Where we're gonna have um, self pollination occurring, but in some species you can't have self pollination. We're gonna have cross pollination, right? So in different types of for example, um, some olive trees, right? Um, I don't think pea plants specifically would have that difference as well. But uh, different types of species, and we have an example of a species there, right? Would actually have male plants and female plants, right? So you're gonna have some amount of cross pollination occurring in order for the species to continue, right? In order for um, an filial generation to continue, right? To proliferate, right? So in this case, self-pollination is completely impossible. And that makes sense because you only have male flowers in one tree and then the other tree has only female flowers. So you can't actually have self-pollination. It will not occur. All right. So when something is dioecious within um, this kingdom, right, plants right, themselves, what we're looking at is something more, more or less kind of what we see in mammals, right? What we see in, in um, humans specifically, where we have a male genetic human, or we have a female genetic human. In this case, we're going to have a male tree and a female tree. Makes sense, right? Yes, please. Lovely. So, Daikagami no, right, speaks to um, the temporal differences, right? So, we know that there are temporal um, aspects of variation. We should have known that, right? There are temporal aspects of variation that you guys looked at in module two. So what we're looking at is a temporal aspect here. So daikogami basically speaks to the fact that the carpels, right? The carpels and the stamens, right? The genesium and the androecium are not operational at the same time. Right? They do not open at the same time. So it reduces the chances of cross-pollination in this case. Right? So what we're generally looking at is the fact that the male reproductive part and the female reproductive part may not be open at the same time. And in the instances when they're at the open at actually the same time, right, we're going to have what we call different types of seasons, right, occurring, right? Um, I'm going to explain what that means in a little bit more, um, in a little bit more detail after I speak about protogeny and protandry, right? So I'm going to get back to dichogamy in a little bit, right? So if you look at different types um, of species like the Aristo, um, Aristolochia, right? It's a species that shows protandry. So this means that the stigma would prefer, well, actually, um, will be preferred over the Andresium, right? So the Genesium would mature first, right? So the Genesium would be, will actually um, mature and then accepts pollen before we have the Andresium, right? mature in which the anthers will open in, the, in that case right so what we're saying is that the stigma itself will actually start um hold on in this case we're not looking at um we're not looking at dioecious plants we look at monoecious plants right so in this case the stigma can actually start accepting pollen right before the anther of the same plant is developed so what does this mean if the stigma develops before the anther, right, in this case, where is it going to get its pollen grains from? It's going to get its pollen grains from other plants. So it promotes cross-pollination in this case, right? If that makes sense. Because what's happening here is that when the stigma matures, right, it's going to be pollinated by pollen grains coming from other plants, right? So that's what's happening in, in protangery, right? Well, in protogeny in this case, my bad, right? In a species like Biden's Pelosa, we're going to have protandry, right? So this means that the anthers will mature and start to release pollen grains before the stigma is ready to accept them. So in this case, now in protandrous plants, right, it's going to be releasing pollen grains to other plants for cross-pollination, 
before its own genesium is developed, right? So that's generally what's happening here, right? So in many dichogamous species, there is a period of over overlap when the andresium opens, releasing pollen, right? And the stigmas are ripe enough to allow for self-pollination, right? Well, to allow for self-pollination as a failsafe, right? So what's happening here, you know? In dichogamous plants, right, we know that there are different times of maturation, right? There's either a protandrous species or a, pro or a protogenous species, right? So what it's doing is trying to promote cross-pollination. And we understand why species would promote cross-pollination because we have more variation, right, in that case, right? But in, ca in the case of the fact that, okay, in the area, there are no specific um, trees or no other um, plant species there, right, of the same species. There are no other plants present, right? In that case, now, there will be a period in time where they're going to be opening, Right, they're gonna be maturing right at the same time, which allows for self-pollination to occur, right? As a failsafe. Basically, if it's only one tree alone existing, right, it's going to go through these diff types of the dichogamous procedures, right? Actually, if it's protogenous first or if it's protandrous first, right? But in the case that there are no other plants for cross-pollination, right? There are going to be periods in time where both right the anthra and the stigma, right, will become active, right? Basic, basically, the anther will actually start releasing pollen and the stigma will ripen at the same time for self-pollination to occur, right? Just in case, right, of cross-pollination not occurring, right? So that's what's happening there, okay? So in this case, now, usually in dichogamous plants, we're gonna have different types of um, seasons, right? And it could be thought of, it's not exactly the same thing, but it could be thought of different seasons that occur within plants, right? For example, you have different seasons for different types of fruits, and this basically means that at different times within the year, right, the stigma and the anther become active at different times in the year, right, um, allowing for, you know, the proliferation of fruits. So, for example, mango season is different from, let's say, papaya season because there are different times in the year in which these plants will actually go through these procedures, right, in order for fertilization to take place. And we're going to look at the entire fertilization process, right? Okay. Is that fine so far? All right. Headers to Lino is different. Right? If you type a question in the chat, I'll be able to see it as well, so it shouldn't be a problem, okay? So, header silly is different now. So, in existing, um, it's basically the existence of plants with two types of flowers within its species, right? So, some plants have flowers with the anthers above the stigma, right? So, the style is very short. And some plants have flowers with the stigma towering over the anthers, where the style is very long. Right, that's basically what he's saying, right? I think the first person who answered the question here, he did speak about the fact that there are different types of flowers. Right? So in the plant in species, right, that exhibit heterostyly, right? What we're gonna have here is the is the creation of different types of flowers, right? So one that is more um andres um androgynous, right? In the case, and one that is more um generally just um genesious. Right, so what we're basically speaking about is that a flower can exist with short styles and long, um, with short styles, right, specifically to flowers with long styles, right, and then flowers will with long styles, right, to flowers with short styles, right. What we're basically looking at is that there are different types of flowers in that case, right, and this ensures insect pollinators, right, will pick up pollen on different parts of their body and transfer the pollen, right, in this case, right. So they will transfer the pollen, right, in those two points that we see there, right? So they'll actually transfer the pollen, right, from flowers with short styles to flowers with long styles. Or you can transfer pollen from flowers with long styles to flowers with short styles, right? So it allows for fertilization to occur on different parts of the body, right, of the flower. And that's, well, not of the flower, of the plant itself, right? Different parts of the plant, right, or different, part, different types of flowers on the plant, right? there can be different um, fertilizations occurring. 
right, or what we call different pollinations, rather, right? Because pollination is different from fertilization. So we're gonna look at that, right, as well in examples. And there's a diagram of hysteresis, right, um, that I want us to look at, all right. So hysteresis basically tries to um ensure some amount of cross pollination, and we're gonna look at that, all right. With self incompatibility, now, right, what we're looking at is that the plants themselves, right, we're gonna have some plants that up that when cross pollination occurs, right it really doesn't um go on to fertilization right so plants also do um have genes right that determine whether or not the pollen grains germinate and grow on stigmatic surfaces right so let's say that the s gene right has multiple alleles right if a pollen grain has an allele that is the same as the one in the stigma it will not germinate so what it's saying is that this in the case of species that are that have self incompatibility self pollination cannot occur right that makes sense right so in this case that we have no self pollination occurring right because the pollen of the plant cannot actually activate the stigma of another right we can't actually have germination occurring all right so that will not happen and then we also have male sterility right so some mutations result in the failure to produce pollen grains right so no pollen grains produced right so this can be a result of different types of mutations in the genes on chromosomes right in the nucleus and also genes in the mitochondria as well right or in mitochondria right plants that have the mutant allele cannot self-pollinate so have to cross-pollinate instead right so what we're looking at is that self-incompatibility right and male sterility actually completely reduces the chance of self-pollination right and in this case the plants will have to pollinate right or have to um reproduce via cross pollination right so that's what we're looking at here so we're gonna make reference to some of these as we go throughout the entire module right or the entire topic really okay is everything fine thus far any questions about the slide Um, sir? Go ahead. Are you hearing me? I can. Um, I'm not understanding why the, um, the daikon gummy plants, mm -hmm. I'm not understanding why those plants reduces the chances of cross-pollination. Reduces the chances of cross-pollination? All right. So, in the case of, yes. if you have dicarbon, uh, dicarbon species, right? You have plant A and plant B, right? What's happening here is that for the general species themselves, hold on, the general species themselves, right? What we're going to have happening is that in different times, right? We're going to have the stamen, right? Um, and the carpels um, opening, right? So let's say that the stamen, right, is now something is now um active, right, in the species, right? Within the other plant species, right? Let's say that in that case, right, within all the plant species generally, right, the stamen is active, but the carpel is not. So no matter how you transfer pollen from the stamen, right, of one plant to the other, it will not pollinate because the carpels are not going to be active, right? And then in another case now, let's say that the carpels are now active, but the stamen is not. So the carpel will be there waiting for pollen, right? And pollen will not come. Because within that species, right, the stamen is not active at the same time the carpel is, right? So what's happening here is that cross-pollination is reduced in this case because, right, we're going to have the two different sex organs. Well, it's generally the same sex organ, but what we're looking at is the two different types of flowers, right, or the two different parts of the flower, are not active at the same time right so there's gonna be no general pollination occurring right within that period of time so it reduces the, the chances of cross-pollination occurring right but what generally happens here why we link that now to protogeny and protandry right is because what we're seeing is that one matures before the other in the species but there is a period in time right in which right if the lack of cross pollination, if cross pollination, right, is not actually happening within the species, because what we're looking at now, you know, is that let's say that 
the stigma of one general plan right is active right and then know the answer of another general plan right is active right and cross pollination is supposed to occur if cross pollination does not occur at any point in time then we're gonna have a period in which both are open right especially within the same plants right and we're gonna have self pollination occurring right so in the case that cross pollination really doesn't occur right because we're, do, we're just we're reducing the chance of cross pollination so in the case that it doesn't occur right then we're gonna have self pollination occurring all right so that's generally what it's really speaking about okay so we we'll look at protandria and protogeny where right? we're looking at protogeny is the fact that um what we're, what we're looking at is that there's priority right given to the female part right and then protandry would be the fact that the male part is given priority when the female part is bad right it's same thing like being um misandrous and misogynous Ginny speaks to the female part right and andre speaks to the male part so anytime we mention anything that has Andre, it speaks to the priority of the male over the female part, right? And if we speak to Ginny, right, or in the case of protogeny, um, then it will be speak to the it will be speaking to the female part being put over the male part, right? So that's generally the key terms that we generally use to describe these different types of plants, right, in specific relation to reproduction. Okay. So we're going to be looking at the formation of the pollen grain, right? So in angiosperms, pollen is produced by the anthers of the stamens in the flowers, right? So in gymnosperms now, right, it is formed by microsporophiles, right? So we're going to be really looking, we're not going to look at that, right? We're going to be looking at the angiosperms. But I put here the difference, right? So gymnosperms produce pollen differently right than the angiosperms and what we're looking at in keep is the angiosperm specifically all right so let's look at that right so each stamen is composed of a filament and an anther and we generally know that right we know that the filaments right would actually contain xylem and phloem for, for transport right so we know that the phloem will transport the um the different types of dissolved ions and sucrose amino acids any other type of dissolved substance that the cells will need and we know that xylem will actually just transport water right and some amount of dissolved ions as well whatever is dissolved in the water the xylem will transport the flowing will actually transport usually um a mixture of solutions with high concentration of sugars right so we're gonna have that there right so we know that each anther is composed of four different pollen sacs where the pollen greens develop right so the anther itself right that is where the pollen grains develop that's what we're talking about right and we have different types of cells that we're going to be looking at so the diploid cells right which divide by meiosis to produce our pollen grains is called our mother cell right so our pollen mother cell is where everything really comes from right so we're going to be looking at this section um this section here that really speaks to the stages of meiosis and how we have pollen um, proliferation right so let's have a we're gonna have a look at that right but one one i want to look at first is really the structure of the antho so this is a cross section of the antho a mature um antho itself when it opens and we're gonna have mature pollen grains leaving right so we have the structure of the antho here and then the dark circles but well the dark circles that we're seeing on the electro um graph right is the mature pollen grain right so each anther has four pollen sacs and when it matures right they're gonna open right and then it's going to allow the ejection of the different types of pollen grains or the different pollen grains all right so generally right we have a micrograph of an anther we are supposed to know how to really draw these and understand how they work right so we're going to basically have thick cellulose walls right um generally around the anther right so we're gonna have all that packing tissue or what we call the connective tissue right generally right and the pack and the vascular bundle that is at the center there right so up here that i'm not sure if you're seeing my curve so let me see if i can get the laser pointer so here i'm looking at the vascular bundle and we know that that is um coming from it's a part of the filament right so the filament actually has this vascular bundle traveling alongside it right that allows for nutrients to actually reach the maturing um 
pollen, right? Pollen grains, rather. Okay? We're going to have the filament themselves as well. The filament itself is just really filled with a fibrous tissue, right? So it's just a stalk itself that supports the anther and props it into the air, right? And then looking at here now, we're going to have a general pollen sac. So it has, it's surrounded by a fibrous layer as well, right? And then within it now, right, we're going to have what we call the tapetum, right? Or what some people call it the tapetum, right? So we're going to have the tapetum. Right, and within the tapetum layer, right, um, it actually provides nutrient to the different types of mother, well, to the different mother cells here within the sac, right? So the tapetum is actually filled with these different types of cells, right, with actually which actually provides nutrients to the pollen mother cells, right here, and then when they actually continue to develop and the anther actually continues to actually mature. What we're going to have is the stonium, right? Well, not stonium, the stomium rather, right? The stomium itself will actually split apart, right? When the anther is actually fully mature, right? So within the different sacs, right? We have the tapetum providing nutrients to our pollen mother cells, right? And then we're going to have what we call, um, in this case, we're going to have what we call gametogenesis occurring, right? So the creation of the different gametes, different pollen cells, right? From the pollen mother cells. And then after the anther is now fully mature, the stomium will now give way, it will split, right? And allow the pollen to actually escape, all right? So I didn't mention this layer here. The outer layer of generally any type of biological component is what we tend to call the epidermis, right? So generally the outer layer cells would be the epidermis that helps protect or to enclose, right? All of these um, apparatus, right? Within the anther itself right so that's what's happening there right okay so here's another description right or another diagram of how an anther would look right right so we have the end the end the endothesium right um specifically the endothesium is what we were calling up here right the packing tissue so the general cells right would do what would be what we call the endothesium right so the general cells are the endothesium, right? Then we're gonna have the middle layers, which are generally fibrous tissue, right? And then when we enter um, the pollen sacs itself, we're gonna have the tapetum or the tapetum, right? Which are basically um, um, sporogenous tissue, right? Which actually provides the nutrients, right? And within the tissue itself, the sporogenous tissue, right? That we're gonna have what we call the micro um, sporangium. And it's from the sporangium, what we we'll call the mother cell, we're going to have meiosis occurring that produces our pollen cells, right? Our pollen um, grains, okay? So that's generally what we have there for the structure. Are there any questions as it relates to the structure of the anthem? Any issues? All right, are we ready to move on? Okay, so just briefly just place a one in the chat if we're ready to move on. Just giving people time to realize that whether if they have a question, they can ask it so we can continue. All right, we're continuing, All right? So we're gonna look at this, right? This is what we generally call um, the gametogenesis within angiosperms, right? So we're going to look at all what's happening here. We're going to have the, the mega, rather, the megasporangium here, right? And we're going to have that. That is what we call the pollen mother cell. And it's going to go through meiosis, right? And actually subdivide to create different types of pollen. Well, different pollen grains, right? Different discrete pollen grains. Right, and then within each pollen grain, we're gonna have nuclear division or what we call endomitosis. Right, so it's not gonna split, you know, but it's the nuclear um, membrane inside what is within the cell itself will actually um, split apart to produce what we call a tube nucleus and a generative nucleus. Right, we're gonna look at it, okay? So the formation of the pollen, right? Pollen grains have a thin inner wall that we call the intine made of cellulose and a thick outer wall, right, which is the exine, right, made of what we call the sporopollenin, right, which is, is, it's actually one of the toughest biological materials, right, 
that we see within this realm of biology, right? So it's tough and waterproof, right? So there are also pits within the X scene, right? And we're going to look at why the pits are there. If we look at why the pits are there, right? It helps for actually germination between these pits so you can actually split the X scene open. We're going to look at that. And the haploid nucleus within the pollen grain divides by mitosis to now form generative nucleus and R2 nucleus, okay? So what we have here is our megasporangium, right, or our pollen mother cell, right? It is diploid. And can anybody tell me what diploid means? What is has 2N, it's only 2N. 2N, generally, right? So it has generally, um, so when we talk about the diploidy, right? generally means it has two n n being the number of genetic um variants right in the number of genetic variants meaning that um the number of genetic material so two times that right so it's gonna have two n right now the megasporangium is going to go through meiosis and we know it's gonna produce two cells right meiosis one right and then we know that there are two steps here right so we're gonna go through meiosis two right so what's happening here now? We remember how this works, right? It's gonna be diploid 2N, right? And then we're gonna have DNA replication, right? Allowing for a 4N um, cell to actually produce um, two other 2N cells, right? If, I, if you're not getting it, you know, you can stop me, right? So we have a 2N cell. We're gonna have, we're gonna replicate that now to create 4N, and then it's gonna split in meiosis one to create two twin cells, right? So it's gonna be two diploid cells, right? And then those two diploid cells are not now going to split again now through meiosis two, right? To create four haploid cells, right? So this is what we call the tetrad of the haploid microspores, right? So this is what we call a tetrad, right? And we know that tetra means four, right? So we have a tetrad here with the microspores, four microspores, right? That are all haploid and they're all combined. And then we're gonna have the secretion of walls, um, the secretion of the secretion of walls, right? So what we're talking about here in this step is that we're gonna have the separation of the pollen grains, right? They're gonna separate into four distinct grains, and this is what really happens here. So within the anther itself, they're gonna have multiple, probably millions upon millions of microsporangia, right? And all of them, right, are going to really go through this process to produce four right um pollen grains right so this is the process right and now we have the larger look of what that mature pollen grain would look like right so remember at the end of um the splitting right so at the end of this gametogenesis what we have here is one solid nuclei right so the solid nuclei itself is going to actually split to produce or split via mitosis to produce our generative nucleus, right? Which actually form later forms the two male gametes, right? And actually now we have the pollen tube nucleus, right? So two nuclei are gonna split, right? Are gonna um emerge after the split, right? And then we have our inner membrane, which is the intine, and then the extra the exterior rough um membrane here would be what we call our X scene, right? So it's generally rough, right? And why it's rough, it really um, allows for its attachment um, to the fur or the hair of different types of animals, right? So when you look at bees pollinating, like it has all the pollen grains sticking to the bees, right? It's because of the X gene being, the X gene actually being very rough, right? And it allows it to attach to smooth surfaces, right? So it, that's how it really allows for pollination to occur. It's one of the structural benefits, right? And then we have pits in between different sections of the X team. All right. Any major issues there? All right. So let me just briefly go over it. We have the megasporangium, right? It goes through meiosis to produce a tetrad, right? The tetrad will separate into individual pollen grains. The pollen grains will continue to grow, right? And then it will be considered as mature when its nucleus separates via mitosis 
to produce the generative nucleus and the pollen tube nucleus. That's what's happening here. Everybody is fine? Are there any questions or concerns here? Any questions or concerns? All right. So we're going to go into pollination, you know, right? We are going to go into pollination now. So if there are any questions or concerns with what's happening before, well, what's happening before with the um, gametogenesis, with the production of our pollen genes, please ask any questions, clarify, all right? If not, we're going to be moving forward. Alright. So let's have a look here, right? So let's look at what happens before pollination, right, within our ovary. Right? So at the base of the genesium, right, we're gonna have an ovary. Within the ovary itself, you now, right, it's basically a swollen, um, it's gonna basically going to be like a swollen um place. Right? So the ovary is really a swollen um, base of the carpel, right, specifically, which has one or more ovules, right? Now, each ovule is attached to the inside of the ovary, right, so that it receives water and nutrients, right, specifically, right? Then the integuments will enclose, right, the new cellus, right, and a diploid embryo sac, or what we call the mother cell, that divides now by a meiosis, to form four haploid nuclei, right? We're gonna be looking at this, how it works, right? But what we're doing is describing what's happening first, and then we go to the diagrams, right? So what we have is this over at the base, right? That is surrounded or enclosed, right? Um, encloses the new cellus, right? Um, and diploid um, mother cell, right? By what we call the integuments, right? And within this mother cell now, we're gonna have the division, right, by meiosis to produce four haploid nuclei, right? Three of these de degenerates leaving one nucleus to divide by mito mitosis, right? And it will form four haploid nuclei. These now move to occupy positions inside the embryo sac that we can now see in this diagram, right? So what, what was I saying, right? We're saying that here, we have at the bottom of the carpel, the swollen ovule, right? We're going to have the ovule here, right? We can look at more um, extensive diagrams, right? So the ovule um, is here, and we have the embryo sac inside the ovule, right? Surrounded, surrounding the ovule is, we, what, we, is what we call the integuments, right? So the integuments encloses it, and this entire structure is what we call the new cellus, right? So within the new cellus, right, we have the integuments, right, generally, surrounding the ovule, which has the mother cell inside, right? The nucleus of the mother cell will divide by a meiosis, right? And here we can see in the second step, now the meiosis step produces so four haploid cells, right? And then what we're going to have now, right, is actually the degeneration of three of them while one haploid cell takes over, right? So we have one huge haploid cell, right, within this embryo sac. And what we're going to have now is three degenerate other cells, right? Now, mitosis occurs to that one haploid cell, right? And what we're going to do is produce two nuclei, right? And then we're going to have um, mitosis again, right, to produce four nuclei now right so what's gonna happen now right is going to be the migration right so what we're gonna have is basically mitosis occurring to produce the cells that that we have in here right what we're gonna is ha have is three of the cells right will migrate to the top right towards um it's gonna migrate to the top towards the chalets or, or right towards the top of the ovule right and these are what we call the antipodal cells, right? Three of them are going to go towards the bottom, right? 
is what we call the synergids, right? And then two nuclei will remain in the center, right? Which we call the two polar nuclei, all right? So that's been generally what's happening here. All right? So we're going to have three different sets of mitosis occurring, right? And then three of them now, three of the nuclei will actually um, develop cells and become antibodies, antipodal, oh, sorry, antipodal cells at the top, right? We're gonna have three synergids, right, at the bottom, right? And in the middle, we're just gonna have two floating polar nuclei, right? And that is really um, what we call the, um, the ovum, the developed ovum, right? Or not, well, not really developed ovum per se, but the developed ovary, right? That we're gonna, this is what's gonna happen before um, we have what we call pollination fertilization right so this is basically the, the development of the genesium right so this is what's happening here are there any questions or concerns any questions Any questions, concerns from anyone? No? All right. So this is just great to look at what we're looking at for the new cellos, right, in the middle here, right? So what we have here now is the general structure of everything, right? What we have is the funiculus, right, which is basically the structure that supports the entire, um, this entire structure in the middle of the ovary, ovary rather, right? And then what we're gonna have here now is what we call a, um, a wraith, right? Or some people call it a raffi. Not sure what the proper pronunciation may be, but you guys could probably figure it out. And it's basically some fibrous um, cells, some fibrous material that helps to keep the structure upright, right? And then we're gonna have the chalaza up here, which is generally just a midpoint before we actually start to split into what we call the integuments that surrounds the new cellus, which is just a group of cells that surrounds our embryo sac, or what we call our ovule. We know that ovule and embryo sac are interchangeable, right? And within our mature ovule, we have three antibodal cells at the top, three, um, well, actually two synergids and one egg cell at the bottom, right? So we have, so what happens in the first slide? We have three synergids, right? And one of them will become our egg cell, right? So we have that our ova there, our ovum rather, right? And then here now in the middle, we have our um, definitive nucleus, right? And that nucleus is, what is basically going to become our two polar nuclei, right? After it goes through mitosis there, right? And the, everything is now basically positioned above the micropyle. Right? And we're going to know what the micropyle is. The micropyle is going to be that area where our cell nucleus, right? We're going to, our tube nucleus rather, we're going to look at it in the fertilization stage, right? This is going to be the opening for our fertilization to take place, right? So we're just generally looking at the entire matured thing here, all right? So what's happening here, right? We generally just have pollen green and embryo sac formation. Right, this is just having both of them um, supplied on one slide, right? So what we have here is the development of the genesium and the development of the andresium, right? When they develop at different times, we know that when the anther develop before the, before the um, ovule, right? We're gonna have what we call a protandrous plant, right? And then if we have the ovule now developing, right, before the andresium, Right, we're gonna have what we call a protogenous plant. All right, so hopefully this makes sense. Everything is fine so far. All right, so it's something to remember when we actually have our developed um, ovule. Right, what we're gonna have right is three antibodial cells at the top, and what we're gonna have is generally three synergids at the bottom. Right. But one of the synergids will become our ovum, right? So at the end, we'll speak about the fact that there will be now two synergids, right? And one, what we call the egg cell or the ovum, right? And then in the middle, 
right we're gonna have a two polar nuclei right so we're, we're gonna have what is called a definitive cell in the middle right and then that's going to actually um my go through mitosis and then it's gonna generally disintegrate and we're gonna have no it's just our polar nuclei our two polar nuclei all right so that's what's happening here now for pollination right what's happening via pollination can anybody just tell me what pollination is though before we move on what's pollination The transfer of pollen. The transfer of pollen from to, from where to where? From the anther to the stigma. Lovely, right? So that is what pollination is, right? Thank you for that. So it's just a transfer of pollen from the anther to the stigma, right? Whatever route it may take, whether it be using water, air, insects, birds, whatever it may be, right? As long as pollen grains. Right, from an anther get to the pollen grains of a suitable stigma we're going to have what we, that's um pollination all right so we're just generally gonna have that no difference between self and cross pollination what's the difference now anyone the difference between self and cross pollination Um, self is with the same plant, and then cross is with two different plants. With two different plants, okay. Alright, so that's generally the difference. Okay, so everything should be fine. So self-pollination, right, we know what happens when pollen is transferred from the anther, right, to the stigma of the same flower, or between different flowers of the same plant. So some persons will mix it up, can mix it up, right, and say that, okay, cross-pollination is transferred between two different flowers. But we need to make sure that it needs to be two different flowers or two completely different plants. Because if it transfers from two different flowers and it's of the same plant, it's still self-pollination, right? So it's generally, right, so this process can occur between a single flower through mechanisms such as autogamy, right? Or between flowers and the same plant through mechanisms of what we call getonogamy, right? So I want you guys to look at, to just generally just define autogamy and getonogamy. On your own timing everything should be fine there right so there, these are not terms that we tend to use a lot right but it may be something useful to just figure out okay so self-pollination ensures reproductive success even when pollinators are scarce right or absent so it is common in plants with cleistogamous flowers what is cleistogamy um, cleist, um, cleistogamy right so cleistogamy or cleistogamy whatever you want to pronounce it right what is cleistogamy? So I want you guys to know what cleistogamy is. What is it? So just have a definition of it, right? So autogamy, gitogamy, gitonogamy rather, and what we have as the Cleistogamy or cleistogamy, right? I want us to define those three, they need to be defined, all right? So, cleistogamous flowers that don't open but still produce seeds via self fertilization, all right? So, we're looking at that self pollination here, all right? Cross pollination, no, right? It's pollination that occurs when pollen is transferred from the anther of one flower, right? To the stigma of another flower on a different plant, right? So this process facilitates genetic diversity within plant um, populations, right? As it introduces new genetic material from different individuals, right? So plants that rely on cross-pollination often have adaptations to attract pollinators such as insects, birds, brightly colored. Um, these are generally the brightly colored petals, right? And the sweet nectary, right? That produces nectar, right? And then sometimes plants have different types of pheromones that affect um, the navigation systems of some insects, right? So the pheromones will attract the insects or attract different um, animals towards it, okay? So that is generally that. So in c you have looked at the difference between wind pollinated, right, and water pollinated and those different types of flowers, right, um, versus cross pollinated flowers, right? So you'd have understood that from c okay?
So ensuring cross fertilization. Now there are a number of reasons why some plants or florists will want to allow self pollination and self fertilization to occur, right? And that is usually what we call inbreeding, right? So inbred plants. There are a lot of reasons why we would want inbred plants to occur, right? As desirable traits can be predictably passed down along generations. So if I want a flower, right, that's the same characteristics, right, as the flower that I had before, then self-pollination right and i'll basically get back a copy of the other floor right but sexually and not asexually all right so we're gonna have that right and it's also used to produce large numbers at a very rapid rate because if you only need one individual to produce two right as opposed from two individuals to produce more right then it's gonna be much faster right this happens easily right with hermaphroditic plants right which means that they have both male and female parts right and we know that if a plant does a plant species don't have male and female parts on the same plant or on the same flower, right? What is that called? When we have two different species, two different plants for two different um, flowers, what is that called? Um, dioecious. Right, dioecious plants, right? So non-dioecious plants are what we call hetero, hetero. Um, sorry, not hetero. Um, hermaphroditic plants, right? We can have the self pollination occurring, right? But how do we ensure right cross pollination, right? So remember, you know, when we say self um when we look at self fertilization, we know that our self pollination, right? We know that that's interesting, right? Or that's important, right? As it relates to creating a large amount of individuals, right? In a small amount of time, right? Or maintaining traits. But we may want to cross pollinate, right? In certain cases, I know the slide says cross fertilization. It is change at the cross pollination, right? So we cross pollinate, right? No, when we want a different um, genetic setup, right? Let's say that we want a more diverse species. Then it enforces a more that more diverse species, right? As we have varying alleles among the members, it increases the chance of the plants having resistance to factors such as pathogens, right? And allows for evolution to occur, right? So this is um, when we look at Darwinian um, theories in module two, right? That is what we're going to be really speaking about, right? As a result, plants have developed certain outbreeding mechanisms, right, to help them to prevent negative um, effects of cell fertilization and ensure um, that diversity of species occur, right? So what we're looking at here is what we call heterostyly. Remember we look at heterostyly on around the third slide, I think, right? Heterostyly is here, right? So what we're looking at is that the fact that let's say that we have S1 and S2. What that generally means is a gene, right? So if we have different types of, if we have different pollen, right, going towards a stigma, right? Let's say that the stigma, right, attracts the, all types of pollen grains, right? So the pollen grains that it's attracting, right, um, is going to allow to the activation of the S1 and S2 gene, right? So it's completely compatible to the pollen grains it's getting, right? This is talking about the pollen of the same plant, by the way, right? So there are plants that are completely compatible, right, to its own pollen. There are plants that are only half compatible to its own pollen. And there are plants who are completely incompatible to its own pollen, right? So that makes sense. So it's self-incompatibility. And it's one of the terms that we looked at before that, remember, that I spoke to you about the different terms that we're going to be looking at. When we have heterostyly, right, we can have complete compatibility or complete incompatibility, self incompatibility, right? So, this is just generally what we're looking for, all right? Or what we're looking at in case of heterostyly. Everything here is fine? Lovely. Sir, can you go over that, please? Okay. About self incompatibility and all of that. Okay, so in this case, in the diagram, let's treat the pollen, right, as coming from the same plant, right? Let's treat everything as coming from the same plant, right? So this, so what we have is the anther of my plant now, right, is actually going to be sending pollen grains to the stigma of my same plant. Now, if my plant is completely compatible, we're going to have complete self-pollination being able to occur, right? If it is only half compatible, meaning that there are two different genes, let's say that one of the genes are not compatible, right? 
we're going to have half compatibility meaning that the rate at, not the rate at which um but the hmm, what would i say now the chances of self-pollination occurring will be completely half because it's only half compatible but in the case of complete incompatibility or self incompatibility this happens when the stigma does not react to any of the pollens from the same flower or from the same plant so that is self incompatibility when you cannot be pollinated by the pollen coming from your same plant make sense All right. So this is what we're this is what we're talking about um, when we're talking about the stigma, right? And for the headers to the over here, we're looking at the fact that the stigma can be longer than the um, the filaments for the anthers, or the anthers can be longer than the filaments for the anthers, right? So this is the header to But over here is really looking at um, usually when we're looking at plants with header to right they actually have different variations of this incompatibility or compatibility right but this here is generally how we ensure right that a plant can either self-pollinate or to ensure that it can't self-pollinate right we're generally looking at we're generally look at the genes and stuff like that and looking at what's compatible with what all right so here on the right, left we're looking at um compatibility and on the right we're looking at headers too, right okay so what happens next now? Now we're going to go into um, the entire um, process now. We're going through the processes, right? So it's really a stepwise thing and I organize them into the different steps, right? So first we have pollination. Pollination marks the beginning of the reproductive process for, for, for our angiosperms, right? And we know that the pollen contains the, main, the male gametes, right? So the pollen which contains our male gametes is transferred from the anther of a flower to the stigma of another flower, right, or of the same flower, right. So this transfer occurs through various agents such as wind, insects, um, ma mammals, or well, animals, right, um, which could be birds, could be mammals, could be other things, but generally animals, right. So these can be agents of pollin pollination, right, and then no pollination occurs, right. So we move the pollen. From the anther to the stigma what we're going to have next is the germination of the pollen grain upon landing on the stigma the pollen grain absorbs the moisture and undergoes germination this process involves the pollen grain forming a pollen tube which grows down through the style right the stalk like structure connecting the stigma and the ovary so it grows through the style right and now the pollen tube right generally is essential for delivering the male gametes right to the ovule right so what's happening here now when we land on the stigma moisture is going to be absorbed and the pollen um grain right itself will germinate right using its tube nucleus to actually create this entire tube right so we're going to create this entire tube Right, the pollen tube using the tube nucleus I'm going to look at it right so this is what's happening here so once the pollen grain we know that the pollen grain when it's mature it has a tube nucleus right and it has a generative nucleus when we land on the stigma right we're gonna have germination so the tube nucleus is going to be what is generating now right this um entire um pollen tube and we're going to be going towards the micropile right so it's going to grow towards the micropyle in the style right and the generative nucleus now is going to now go through mitosis well not mitosis meiosis actually to actually produce our different um gametes our two gametes right well is it going to go through mitosis or meiosis let me think let me think it's going to go through mitosis actually because it's haploid already so it's going to go through mitosis to actually produce two nuclei right so two male gametes right and then the one tube nucleus is generating the tube growing towards the micropyle all right so the tube growth now guided by chemical signals emitting from the ovary 
right so the over is basically saying hello here i am i want you to come here right basically it's acting as it's creating these chemical signals right and the pollen tube now extends down through the style traversing the tissue until it reaches the ovule right so it heads towards the ovary this journey through the style is crucial for ensuring successful fertilization by the di delivering rather the sperm cells precisely to the location of the female gametes or what we call the egg cell within the ovule right so our so our pollen tube will grow through our style towards the micropyle right now we look at the entry to the ovule now once the pollen tube reaches the ovule it penetrates one of the ovules integuments right which is the protective layer through um well that surrounds the ovule right and the tip of the pollen tube now then enters the ovule through a small opening that we call the micropyle right and then we're gonna have what fertilization is occurring right so let's go to what we looked at a while a while ago right let me look at that right so what we're basically saying right is that when the nucleus itself right so when the we're not gonna have a nucleus yet when the pollen falls on this stigma it's going to germinate and that process allows for the two nuclei to start creating the pollen tube and the generative nuclei to actually separate right so that's what we have happening here everybody fine so far everyone fine are there any questions are there any concerns i think a powerpoint is having issues but are there any con concerns thus far we spoke about everything except for double fertilization any issues sir can you explain what is the microfile please so the micropile is what is described as an opening, right? So let, we're going to have a look at a diagram. Right, we want to have a look at a diagram so we can understand what that is really. All right, so we're going to go back through that and then we're going to enter now double fertilization. All right. Give me one moment, please. 